Jim, you know, uh, just say one thing about what Jim has been talking about that uh, confuses me about our Republican friends sometimes, the MAGA Republicans. No, I mean, I'm being sincere. Every one of the things that Jim mentioned saves the American taxpayer billions of dollars. You realize if you have a prescription drug from any major drug company in America, I can take you to Toronto, Canada, London, Rome, any major capital in the world, and buy the same exact drug for sometimes half the price that you get here. Look, folks, when the federal government, through Medicare, doesn't have to pay out as much money, it means taxpayers pay less money because you fund the federal government. You fund Medicare. Go down every one of these things. It always confused me. They talk about being rational. It's just about excess profit. But at any rate, I don't want to get off on that. I'll get carried away. I don't quite get these guys. Thank you, Jim, for your friendship and, above all, for your, uh, your fellowship. And, Bishop Green, thank you for those kind words. I mean that sincerely. And thank you, Reverend Manning, uh, for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, the shepherd of this house to uh, allow me to stand at this podium once again. And all the faithful of Mother Emanuel and distinguished guests, I was talking downstairs. I, uh, I've spent more time in uh, the uh, Bethel AME Church in Wilmington, Delaware, than I have uh, than most people I know, black or white, have spent in that church. Because that's where I started. So, no, I'm serious. I started a civil rights movement. I used to go to 7.30 Mass, then I'd go to 10 o'clock 10 o'clock service with the Reverend who was then running the church, is now the bishop. She's a bishop, and I'm told your bishop had been there before in South Africa. So that's where he is right now. The point is that I've been blessed to worship here before as well. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, at moments of joy and uh, great joy, and moments of great pain, and moments of unbearable loss, on June 17, 2015, the beautiful souls, five survivors and five survivors, invited a stranger into this church to pray with them. The word of God was pierced by bullets and hate and rage, propelled by not just gunpowder, but by a poison, a poison that has for too long haunted this nation. And what is that poison? White supremacy. Oh, it is. It's a poison throughout our history has ripped this nation apart. It says no place in America, not today, tomorrow, or ever. From that day, this nation saw this congregation, this community, demonstrate one of the greatest acts of strength I have ever seen. I mean this sincerely from the bottom of the act of forgiveness, the act of grace. It was as President Obama sang from here, Amazing Grace. You changed hearts. You did something that may not have happened but for your courage. You brought down the Confederate flag in South Carolina. You brought it down. No, you did. And you helped the nation heal. You showed what America can overcome, what we can be when we want to be something. I'm deeply humbled to speak from this same pulpit my friend, and he was a friend, Reverend Pinkney, spoke from. We all miss him, none more than his family in this congregation. But just as all the families of the Emanuel Nine miss the pieces of their soul that they lost that day, we also have been together at moments of unbearable loss for my family. Two days after the service of Reverend, Reverend Pinckney, my son and I, my surviving son and I, came back. My family worshiped with you for your Sunday service to show our solidarity. But my family also needed to be healed. We didn't even realize how badly. Just 22 days before, we had buried my son, Bo, a veteran exposed and died because of those burn pits in Iraq for a year. We 
we were we 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 were in more pain than we knew. We came here to offer comfort and receive comfort from you. No, I'm serious. As I listened in the pews, spent time with the families, visited Reverend Pinckney's office, visited the memorial for the victims outside, I grew stronger. My son, my family grew stronger. We prayed together. We grieved together. We found hope together, for real, for real. And uh, it reminds me that through our pain, each of us, each of us must find purpose. For me, that purpose is to live a life worthy of my son, Bo, and I mean it sincerely. For you, that purpose is for the lives worthy of loved ones lost and make them proud. So many of you were there for us during that loss including my dear friend Jim and Emily Clavin. Miss Emily, I miss. People of deep faith. Jim, a great public servant, the best friend you could ever have. Jim, I'm thinking of Emily today. We talked about it downstairs a little bit. I know you do every single solitary day. She was special. And that bond you share was something to behold. As many of you know, Jim is a teacher and a student of history. He knows the power of history. He knows the power of truth and the power of lies. He knows what happens when people are allowed to whitewash history, erase history, bury history. He knows what the Bible teaches. We shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. But the truth. The truth is under assault in America. As a consequence, so is our freedom, our democracy, our very country, because without the truth, there's no light. Without light, there's no path from this darkness. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Look, folks, I understand their I understand their passion, and I've been quietly working. I've been quietly working with the Israeli government to get them to reduce and significantly get out of Gaza. I'm using all that I can to do. But I understand the passion. Look, folks, after the civil thank you. Well, thank you. Look, after the Civil War, the defeated Confederates couldn't accept the verdict of the war. They had lost. So they say. They embraced what's known as the lost cause, a self-serving lie that the Civil War is not about slavery, but about states' rights. They've called that the noble cause. That was a lie, a lie that had not just a lie, but it had terrible consequences. It brought on Jim Crow. So let me be clear for those who don't seem to know, slavery was the cause of the Civil War. There is no negotiation about that. 
now, now we're living in an era of a second lost cause. Once again, there are some in this country trying, trying to turn a loss into a lie, a lie which, if allowed to live, will once again bring terrible damage to this country. This time, the lie is about the 2020 election, the election which you made, your voices heard, and your power known. Just two days ago, we marked the third anniversary of the dark, one of the darkest days in American history, January the 6th, the day in which insurrectionists stormed the United States Capitol, trying for the first time in American history to stop the peaceful transfer of power in the country. We all saw with our own eyes the truth of what happened. That violent mob was whipped up by lies from a defeated former president, smashing windows, spraying blood on statues, ransacking offices. Outside, insurrectionists erected gallows, chanting, hang Mike Pence. Inside, they hunted for Nancy Pelosi, chanting, where's Nancy? We saw something on January 6th we'd never seen before, even during the Civil War. Insurrectionists waving Confederate flags inside the halls of Congress built by enslaved Americans. A mob attacked and called black officers, black veterans, defending the nation those vile of racist names. And yet, an extreme movement of America, the MAGA Republicans, led by a defeated president, is trying to steal history now. They tried to steal an election, now they're trying to steal history, telling us that violent mob was, and I quote, a peaceful protest. That that insurrection, those insurrectionists were, these are his words, patriots. That there was, quote, a lot of love that day. In fact, the rest of the nation and the world saw a lot of hate and violence. For hours, the defeated former president sat in a private dining room off of my office, the Oval Office, and did nothing, nothing, no, absolutely nothing. His actions were among the worst derelictions of duty by any president in American history. An attempt, an attempt to overturn a free and fair election by force and violence. Let me say what others cannot. We must reject political violence in America. Always, not sometimes, always. It's never appropriate. The violence of January 6th was an extension of an old playbook. From the, from the threats and violence and intimidation. In Atlanta, Georgia, two brave black women, mother and daughter, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, they had their lives upended just doing their jobs, menacing calls, death threats, forcing them to literally flee their homes. Those pushing the big lie have a conspiracy theory among conspiracy theories that outweighs them all. That there's what, and, and, but here's the fact. There's where we don't have facts. Their whole theory has no facts, has no proof, has no evidence. That's why, tell me again, they lost in every court of law that challenged the results. 60 losses in courts of America. There's one thing they don't have. They don't have respect for the 81 million people who voted the other way, voted for my candidacy, and voted to end the presidency. In their world, these Americans, including you, don't count. But that's not the real world. That's not democracy. That's not America. In America, we all count. In America, we witness to serve all those who, in fact, participate. And losers are taught to concede when they lose. And he's a loser. <laughs> Then we all came together to put the country before ourselves. The lies that led to January 6th are part of a broader attack on the truth of America today that we all have seen before. The same movement that threw out the mob of the United States Capitol isn't just trying to rewrite history, January 6th. They're trying to determine to erase history and your future, banning books, denying your right to vote and have it counted, destroying diversity, equality, inclusion all across America, harboring hate and replacing hope 
with anger and resentment and dangerous view of America. That narrow view of America, zero-sum view of America that says, if you win, I lose. If you succeed, it must be I fail. If you get ahead, I fall behind. And maybe worst of all, if I hold you down, I lift myself up. That's not new in America. Every stride forward has often been met with ferocious backlashes from those who fear the progress, from those who exploit that fear for their own personal gain, from those who traffic in lies told for profit and power. But here in Charleston, you know the power of truth. Less than a mile from here was once a port where almost half of all enslaved Africans were trafficked to North America and forced on our shores. And now you have a world-class museum there to tell the truth about the original sin. And it matters. And I want to thank former Mayor Jim Riley for his leadership, who saw to it the museum was built, and for all of you who made that happen. And with your help, I made Juneteenth the first federal holiday since Dr. Martin Luther King's day. This works. Why? Because the truth matters. The truth matters. With your help, we established the National Monument, Monument in honor of Mamie and Emmett Till. Because we heard Mrs. Till's call, the mother of a 14-year-old son who was lynched and whose body was mutilated. But the mother insisted on an open casting of this funeral because she said, let the world see what I saw. <laughs> the truth matters. It always matters. We can't just to learn, choose to learn what we want to know and not what we should know. We should know the good, the bad, the truth of who we are. That's what great nations do, and we're a great nation, the greatest of all nations. We're not perfect, but at our best, we learn from our past and we look to the future. A nation continuously striving to be a more perfect union. I'm here to speak to another truth. It's because of this congregation and the black community of South Carolina, and not an exaggeration than Jim Clyburn, that I stand here today as your president because of all of you. That's a fact. That's a fact. And I owe you. And I've done my best to honor your trust. That means rejecting the small, narrow, cramped view of America, as well as lifting up the bigger and broader view of America that holds that if you do well, I do well. We all do well. We all do well if every race and background of small towns and big cities is doing better. When our freedoms are protected and we deny hate is a safe harbor for everyone, has a fair shot at a life of dignity and opportunity. And where our democracy works for everybody. It benefits everybody. I don't get these guys. Everybody does better, even those folks who disagree with us. I'm keeping my commitment to you. That's the America we're building together. Instead of erasing history, we're making history. And it starts. And it starts with the administration I committed to, I said my administration would look like America and taps into our full talents and strengths as a nation, starting with our incredible Vice President Kamala Harris. When we came to office, the country was in the depth of a pandemic, which we lost over a million two hundred thousand people. So we moved heaven and earth to get the country vaccinated, saving countless lives. When the economy on the brink we spent — we sent $1,400 checks into the pockets of people who were hurting badly to keep them going. I said we'd invest in all of America, all of America, and we are. The results are clear. <clears throat> the 
over 14 million new jobs, record economic growth, the lowest inflation rate of any major economy in the world. But we have more to do. We see this progress for all Americans. We have the lowest black unemployment rate recorded in a long, long time. More blacks Americans have health insurance than ever, bringing peace of mind and dignity to their lives. I remember when I was a kid, we lived in a three-bedroom house with four kids and a, and a grandpa living with us. And my headboard in my room was up against a little split-level home. It was a, we weren't poor. We were, you know, we weren't, we sure weren't worth the wealthy. And I remember really one night hearing my dad wrestle with the headboard that was along by my headboard on the other side of the wall. I asked my mom the next morning, I said, what's the matter with dad? She said, honey, his employer just told her they're dropping health insurance. What that does is deprive a man and a woman of their dignity. How do you look at your child and say, I can't cover you, I can't take care of you? And now, as Jim pointed out, I won't go into it like I was going to because he said it better. Instead of an average of $400 a month for insulin for seniors with diabetes, they're now paying $35 a month. And by the way, they're still making a profit three times. It costs $10 to make it. I've been trying to take on, as a couple of you in the audience know, for my entire career, Big Pharma. Finally beat them. Finally, finally, finally. <laughs> We're going to go back and make sure that Medicare can no negotiate prices for everybody, not just for seniors. Again, it saves the American taxpayers billions of dollars not having to pay pharma for these things. You know, we're growing back black wealth, but we have a lot more to do. The racial wealth gap is the smallest it's been in 20, <clears throat> 20 years under my watch. More black small businesses starting up. Been in decades, and the ultimate act and open a new business, the ultimate act of, act of hope. We're taking on housing discrimination in many ways. So, a home owned by today, a home owned by a black family on one side of a highway, built by the same builder on the other side of the highway, and a white guy living in it, the white guy's home is valued more than the black guy's. No, I, I know you know it, but guess what? That's how you build generational wealth when you build your home. Kamala and I are leading the charge, mainly Kamala, to protect the freedom to vote and that vote that be counted. Defending your freedom to choose, we're keeping our commitment of providing incredible opportunities, making historic investments in HBCUs, $7 billion. $7 billion. <laughs> They're just as good as other universities, just some of that. They don't have the the billionaire contributors, so they can't put the laboratories together to get the contracts to be the ones that design new aircraft carrier decks, to be the ones that design what's changing. It's changing. Providing people a real shot by reducing the burden of student debt. Jim went into it. I won't go into it as, as we're going to. $132 billion, 3.6 million people. A significant percentage of those students are African-American students. Despite our friends on the other side of the table, the Supreme Court did everything we can to stop me, replacing every lead pipe in America. Do you know how many, not just some, every single lead pipe in America is going to be taken out and replaced with the proper product. <laughs> Why? Because the mostly poor neighborhoods, that's where those lead pipes are, and that's why kids end up with brain damage because of the lead. There's so much, I'm not going to go into it, but look. You can turn on the faucet for your child and doesn't get sick from drinking the water when they come into the home. Delivering high-speed internet, that's affordable for everybody, everybody. So you don't have to sit in McDonald's parking lot for your child to do their homework. Producing clean energy so you can finally breathe clean air without leaving home. Look, I understand it. When we moved from Scranton, I was raising Claymont, Delaware, more major refineries than any place, including Houston, Texas, and just across the border in Chester. Not a joke. I grew up with asthma, and most of us did, because of the prevailing winds. We'd go, my mom would drive us to school in the morning in his young grade school, turn on when there was a frost, turn on the windshield wiper, there'd be an oil slick on the way. Because guess what? It's all the fence line communities that get hurt. Not on my watch. 
it's changing. We know there's more to do making child care and older care more affordable, which would save American taxpayers billions of dollars along the way. Early in my administration, we were out, we, we cut child poverty in half, child po black child poverty in half, by getting families checks every month through the child care tax credit. And the other side went ahead and blocked it. But we're going to get it back. This, look, this fight is over. We're going to come back. Because no child in America should ever go to bed hungry, period, 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 period. Yeah. <clears throat> After the historic movement for justice in the summer of 2020, I signed the most significant police reform executive order in history. We didn't get the law passed, but guess what? I did it by executive order, a significant part of it. But now Congress has to step up and ask and get it to do what I did and make it the law of the land. Just a few days ago, the defeated former president was asked about the recent shooting in Iowa. Do you hear this one? I'm, I'm, it's hard to believe. You know what the response was? All those kids dead? We have to get over it. End of quote. I promise you. We have to get over it. My response is, we have to stop it. <laughs> so your children, your family, your friends can leave your home, walk the streets, go to stores, go to the grocery store, and go to church to be safe from gun violence. There's no excuse for this carnage. We have to ban assault weapons. I did it once before, and I'm going to come back again and do it. Ban high capacity magazines. We have to pass a universal background checks. It doesn't violate the Second Amendment. It's common sense and it saves lives. I'm determined to continue to deliver unequal justice under the law. I made a commitment to you to nominate the first black woman, and Jim's already talked about it, on the Supreme Court. And by the way, she's smarter than the rest of these guys. Oh, her name is Katanji Brown Jackson. But guess what? She knows what she's doing. <coughs> and by the way, as Jim pointed out, more black women have been appointed to the Federal Circuit Courts than every other president in American history has appointed, every single solitary one county. <coughs> and we're going to keep going. Look, I want to make it clear. You all made this possible. Because of your voice, your voice was heard <clears throat> in shaping your destiny. That's democracy. And I'm proud to have led the effort to make sure your voice, the South Carolina voice, will always be heard, because now you're first in the primary. <laughs> Look, our North Star as a nation is the very idea of American an idea, at once the most simple and most powerful idea in the history of the world. That's not hyperbole, it's fact. <clears throat> the idea is this. We're all created in the image of God equally. We deserve to be treated equally throughout our lives. That covenant's a covenant we made with each other, a covenant we've never fully lived up to, but none we never fully walked away from either. And faith and history teach us that however dark the night, joy cometh in the morning. And that joy comes with commands from Scripture. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul. And love your neighbor as thyself. Not so easy. It's hard. But in those commands is the essence of the gospel and the essence of the American promise. And in my life, I've tried to live my faith. And I've many times failed. But I've learned, as many of you, might have learned in your path as well. We're all, we're all imperfect beings. We don't know where fate will take us or when, but we can do our best to seek a life of light, hope, love, and justice, and truth. Yeah. Folks, let me close with this. Denmark Vesey arrived in Charleston enslaved, one of too many, too many from the distant shores wrenched from painful on a painful journey 
not to a promised land, but to a land that promised to deprive them of freedom. But even though they arrived in the land where the life and rife of pain and persecution, they still believed they had promise. But a black church kept them moving. They had faith. They found scripture. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Vesey had his kind of faith. He became a carpenter and a movement leader, concerned with the least among us. That's why he helped found this very church 200 years ago, only 40 years after the Dec Declaration of Independence. And this church, your church now, the black church, has some to come to symbolize the faith and this purpose, to bear witness to those who are suffering, to bring the good news of a future to come, to follow its mission, to be the light in the pathway of darkness. That's patriotism. That's patriotism. To love something so much, you make it better no matter the struggle. A patriotism that inspired generation before us to believe that in America we can do and be anything we want to be. In our time, there's still the old ghost of new, gar and new garments. And we all need to rise to meet the moment. And the moment is now. Yeah. Folks, my fellow Americans, this is a time of choosing. So let us choose the truth. Let us choose America. I know, I know we can do it together. And as the gospel song sings, we've come too far from where we started. Nobody told me the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. My fellow Americans, I don't think the good Lord brought us this far to leave us behind. May God bless you all and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.